Good day and welcome to lesson 41 in our ongoing study of the book of Romans. We're still in chapter 11 and today verses 25 to 32. It must be remembered as we go through this that Paul is primarily speaking to the Gentile people in the church at Rome. And he's talking to them about the salvation of the Jewish people, he himself being Jewish and he himself being saved and he himself now talking about how the Jewish nation would itself be saved again by, by God. But in the meantime, he wants to understand, then they want to understand how their salvation came about and how to the Jewish people, Christ was a stumbling block, a problem in their own salvation. So he's still talking to the Gentile people in the Jewish church, as he mentioned back in verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. So now in uh, verse 24, 25, he's talking about, I do not, do not desire brethren. This is a, an introduction which he often uses when he's talking to people within a church, ta ta calling them his own brethren, his own brothers and sisters. For I do not desire brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery. The mystery of why they were saved and how the Jewish people, who were God's chosen people, seemed to be let out. And he says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Now, mystery in the biblical sense is a little different than the mystery that occurs in many societies. In those societies, you have to become a member, you have to become a, in a part of that society in order to discover the so-called mysteries that are involved. But in the Bible, the mysteries are those substances which are revealed to us by God. And only when they're revealed by God can they really be understood. If you go over to the last chapter of Romans, chapter 16, and it says this in the last part of the chapter. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith the mystery was there since the beginning of time but it was only made known by the prophets, by God through the prophets, and by God when he made it manifest in time. So this is, uh, this is the type of mystery that he's talking about. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. If you go back also to Isaiah, it also explains why this is a bit more difficult, perhaps, for us to understand unless you have had insight or have had revelation yourself. For it says, For my thoughts, speaking of God, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens and higher are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we can't really understand entirely what God is doing at this time. So this is what he's saying. I do not want you, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery that he's been explaining about the salvation of the Gentiles and the problem with salvation for the Jewish people. I do not want you to be desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. In other words, if you don't really understand it, you're going to make up your own opinions, your own ideas about how this is going to come about. And those will probably be totally wrong. It says in Proverbs 26, verse 12, Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? This is what he's referring to here. In your, in your own opinions. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. In other words, people who make these things up or get their own opinions about these things are really more foolish than wise. In Isaiah 5, 21, it says, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. So 
Paul is saying, I want you to be understand this mystery that you would not be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel. Israel has not seen this, has not understood this salvation of God. The blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Because of the reluctance of the Jewish people to accept Christ, they were blinded, so to speak, to the true gospel. This has allowed the Gentiles to come in, ourselves to come in. And as a result of this, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, when the Gentile nation has been, has been brought in by God to where it's supposed to be, when that has happened, all Israel will be saved. But now that, again, doesn't refer to every last person in the nation of Israel, but Israel as a whole will see the light and will be offered the salvation, most of it, many of whom will accept. And then he goes on to talk about a statement from Isaiah when he says, The Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away on godliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. This is really a reference to the Deliverer, Christ, coming out of Zion, the nation of Judah, Jerusalem, coming out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. Referring to the Jewish people, because they have rejected the gospel, they have become enemies of the gospel at this time. But it, it did benefit the Gentiles for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. In other words, God still loves them because of his covenant with the fathers of the Jewish nation, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So they are enemies of the gospel but still be loved for the sake of the fathers. So this is part of the great mystery that is in this first few in these few, few verses of this part of the chapter eleven. The mystery, how God is going to con continue to love and redeem the Jewish people, even though their rejection of Christ and their rejection of the gospel has enabled the Gentile people to be saved and to be brought into the fold. As it says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The promises that he made to the Jewish people, to the nation of Israel, to the patriarchs, they're not changeable. They're not possible to be altered. They are irrevocable. He says, God is unchanging. They are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, speaking to the Gentiles, you have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. Because the Jewish people disobeyed, the Gentiles were given mercy and brought into the fold. You have obtained mercy. So were the first few verses of this section refers to the mystery of how God was going to do things. Now we're talking about God's mercy. God's mercy to us, yet have obtained mercy through their disobedience, even though these also have now been disobedient. And through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has commanded them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on us all. In essence, this is saying, we have obtained mercy because of the disobedience of the Jewish nation. But because we have, have obtained mercy, even though we were disobedient, so the Jewish nation will obtain mercy through their disobedience. In essence, everyone has been disobedient to God's laws and to God's precepts. 
Therefore, God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on us all. This has to do with the mystery of what God, God is going to do and the mercy that he is going to show. This is really what the essence of these few verses is about. We're going to finish this chapter next week. This is a rather short study, but we're going to finish this chapter next week in another short study before we get on to chapter 12. So again, thanks for watching. I hope this has been of some help to you, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye for now.